Okay, so the first place that I want to start is with the master plan. Believe it or not, there is a downtown master plan. It was created in 1999, and it is very good. Um, one of the first things that we always do when we're helping communities to do master plans is we ask to see what plans have been done. Many times, plans don't get implemented not because they're not good plans, but because they they lose the momentum of the constituents. Leadership constantly turns over in city government. So it, it takes a constituent base that has got a vested interest in seeing that vision. Um, this master plan was created in 99. Um, it, it really, I think you'll be surprised. I'm going to show you the main plan graphic on the next slide. Um, the report itself, and I have a copy of it. Chad was uh, kind enough to make sure that that resource got over to me. Um, they do an excellent job at a parking analysis. Now, granted, they use some numbers that might or might not have changed over time, but they, um, they formula base the entire district. They already have the entire district inventoried for spaces. Uh, they do a comparison inventory between available spaces and space usage based off square footage. All this stuff that you probably didn't know existed and it's good. Um, also makes physical recommendations and, um, and you really should be using this master plan to guide and fuel that private sector development. This is the main plan graphic. Um, okay, again, 15 years ago. Wow, look at what they're talking about. Circular development around City Hall County Courthouse, creating synergy between those properties and setting up growth potential there. Um, obviously, pedestrian enhancements along crosswalks, Kaufman Plaza. They've done some things here that show a lot of, I think, detailed understanding of what's going on here, trying to create a detail, I mean, create an activated public space here. Inside the rendering, you actually see the way that this is designed. It's, it's got some interesting design elements to it. It's got elements that drape from building to building, creating an outdoor room type feeling, but they, they take advantage of not just the building space, but creating a plaza along the building and parking lot space. Well, you might say, well, does that take away parking spots? Well, right behind this building, we've got this fantastic yellow concrete curb that splits the parking lot into two non-navigable sections, losing eight parking spaces because of this curb. So you can easily gain the spaces that you lose right back up by taking that curb out. Overall parking capacity in this lot alone is, I think, I think it, all of this ended up being right about 300 some odd spaces. I mean, they've done some really, really good things. They've looked at lots and showed how you can reconfigure those lots to maximize the parking capacity for each of the square footages. Um, one of the other things that I think is really interesting, I don't know if you can see this. This is, um, this is the alleyway in between second and third. And one of the big things that this plan called for was enhancement to the alleyways and utilization of those alleys as true signature elements making your downtown unique. Now, the thing that's been interesting to me to observe is, let's see if I'm oriented right, 41, that's City Hall, old City Hall building. So on the street, mid-block, right next to Old City Hall, there's been treatment done to the crosswalk. Brick columns with uh, concrete uh, balls. That design was designed specifically in the 1999 study. But the thing that was not done was the continuation of stamped concrete throughout the alleyways, creating a different texture and a different rhythm, drawing people in. In addition to that, they're drawn and, and photo rendered elements showing ornate gateway treatments into those alleys, sending people that way. Why do I point that out? It, I think that those things are the things that make places different. And I know that I felt it the same way when I was in the space over there in Masonic Temple and feeling like I wanted that space to somehow better relate to the alley next to it. So this plan 
it doesn't have to be the, the rule in which all things are measured by, but it is an awfully good roadmap. And if you don't have this roadmap, if you don't have this plan to look off of, then every decision you make ends up being a decision made in a vacuum instead of being a vision, a, a decision made as part of an overall vision. So I'm going to make sure that Tammy has a copy of that PDF. as Well, well actually, Chad copied it um, to Tammy when he sent it over to me. It is a really, really, it's not long. It's probably 25, 30 pages of slides at the most. Really good information. Everybody on the bid board really should um, really should take a look at that. And I'm going to do my best as I go through this to point out other things that I'm reiterating that were mentioned or suggested in that 99 plan. Next, create a development corporation. Okay, so you've got a CRA. CRA is the, the city's redevelopment authority. But the thing that you do not currently have is you do not currently have a nonprofit organization that is proactively purchasing property, revitalizing property, prepping property for development, prepping property for the kind of development that you want to see happen. You don't have any entity that's purchasing that profit, uh, purchasing that building, then selling it for a profit after revitalizing it, taking that profit to invest in the next revitalization project. Um, I have done, I've done a lot of, of kind of digging on questions. I've, I've kind of sent feelers out a lot of different ways. Uh, I've told a couple people wrong information as I was kind of digging through this. Um, the thing that I did finally land on is I believe after looking and talking to folks that have done CDCs all over the country, I think your best bet is actually going to be a 501c3. It wasn't, Chad, what we were talking about, it wasn't quite right, right but what a c3 means is it means that is for a community as a whole instead of a restricted group. A C4 is a, um, a geography-based restriction. A C6 is a membership-based restriction. So when you create a 501c3, then you position yourself to be able to create a development corporation that serves the entire community. Now, the thing that couldn't happen, and this is where my confusion had come in, if you were a 501c3 that was set up for a different purpose, let's say that your purpose was to be an arts organization. An arts organization cannot profit from things outside of their organizational purpose. So an arts organization could not necessarily go out and begin purchasing property and serving as a profit-based landlord to help fund their, their nonprofit. Does that make sense? So that's why I was getting confused. So I think 501c3 is going to be the right way for us to go. I think that when you do that 501c3, not only do you stand the potential to pitch development jobs to the CRA, you also have the opportunity to pitch that for a whole host of housing grant opportunities. Um, there are opportunities that are extremely appropriate for CDBG housing money downtown. Now, housing money downtown does have an affordable element to it, but CDBG, and jump in if I'm saying anything, if I'm misspeaking at all, but CDBG does also accommodate what some people refer to as workforce housing or civil servant housing. Those are people that, you know, are police officers, firemen, teachers. These are not, we oftentimes confuse affordable housing from subsidized housing and Section 8 housing. They are dramatically different. So it does not mean that affordable housing is not always a horrible thing in downtown. It helps to create a nice blend. Um, there are requirements built into it that are rent rates versus salaries and all that kind of stuff, ratio relationships. But affordable housing allows for certain upper floors to be used and for you to develop higher numbers of units, smaller square footage per.
So that I think that a lot of what we have done is we have dismissed because we've been scared of that affordable housing. You know, it's not subsidized. It doesn't mean you're having Section 8 downtown. Is that right? You feel yes, pr pretty is, good? Yes, it is. So we have to be very careful. Right. As to who exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Not and, income, but yeah, right. Right. And, and also knowing that a combination of projects that might mix market rate and workforce housing can coexist. You can't mingle the funding, but they can coexist in the same building. Doesn't mean that like you can, you can tackle different, different projects in the same building. You can treat them different ways. Um, this CDC can own property. It can sell it, restore it, and down the road, conceivably, it could operate as an administrator for downtown bids, and I'll talk more about that in a second. You can ignore anything I say you, I, you disagree with, but I want to throw it out there for thought. Okay, you just renewed the bid. The bid is renewed until 2018. One of the things that I heard you all say is from a bid administration standpoint, you deal with some difficulties in that businesses and property owners along first and second feel like they're being left out, feel like they don't get the same attention as third, and that kind of stuff. I get that. The, the dynamics in your downtown are such that first and second are highway, and they're a one-way pair. Because of that dynamic of the one-way pair, there is a much higher traffic, tra higher traffic speed, and less pedestrian-friendly environment on first and second than there is on third. It's just the way that it is. One of the things that you might consider when it comes time for renewal is you might consider splitting that area into two separate bids. More so than anything else, to create a, a conceptual difference between what's going on. But if you create a bid around first and second, you could call it the downtown corridor bid. You use that bid fund to really focus on beautification, a lot of the same uses that we're seeing in other bids throughout the city. And then you go through and you create this downtown bid that would be 3rd Street and the perpendiculars. Address 4th Street. 4th Street, whether you like it or not, 4th Street is part of this district. It's not part of the bid. There are people that argue whether or not it is part of downtown. It has always been divided. It has always been the other side of the track. But there is no doubt that some of the activity and business mix that exist on 4th are influencing the consumer's perception of the overall sense of downtown as a whole. So, that being said, um, I, I'm throwing out there, you, I, think, I think that that 4th Street needs to be a branded identity. Um, I'm throwing out Cali International. This international street is pretty simple, right? Um, I was clever enough to do it in a different language. Um, my wife recommended that I call it World Market. I told her that was a national chain store and we couldn't do that. Um, I don't care what the name is. Uh, the big thing that I want to have happen is I want to have that be something that we all think about. Now, I want to be clear. The bid board went through a process and a discussion and they decided that they did not want to roll forth into the bid. I'm not saying that was a bad decision. In fact, I think that there's probably some benefit to the business owners on forth being able to feel like they are creating a organization on their own to create and craft their own message and vision. But if we start talking about how all the moving pieces fit together, 
I think that we could see that the administration of that 4th Street bid could exist underneath that community development corporation. Does that make sense? Does everybody, I don't, you don't have to agree with me, but it does it make, does all that logic kind of fit into place? Okay, cool. All right. Next, pitch a plan for hospitality tax. City passed a hospitality tax to help fund debt service on state fair property. The debt service collection, and Jay, you jump in on me if I'm misspeaking on this. Debt service collection is, is uh, coming in at a higher rate than was projected, which is good news. And it means that um, that, that debt service is going to be retired relatively soon. But uh, that H tax was not an ongoing, never-ending tax. So there is a time in the near future where the decision has to be made whether to go in and renew the hospitality tax or whether to allow it to retire. I highly recommend that the major quasi-governmental organizations in the community with a focus on downtown and the Convention and Visitors Bureau get together and craft a, a proposal for the most appropriate way to invest future hospitality tax monies to foster, nurture, and grow the hospitality industry in Grand Island. Does that make sense for everybody? One of the things that I think is, as you go through that, um, the CVB's job is to bring people to this region they are a organization that, although their identity is Grand Island, their geography is much larger than that. Um, they have made a very hard decision on their standpoint, and I'm, I'm speaking from having worked with organizations like this before. They've made a very hard decision, but the correct decision in knowing that Grand Island is the identity for them to market. So they are bringing to market our community's identity. They are bringing people to this community. Um, and we already have heard a little bit about some of the, the things that they have identified as needs. How does the downtown fit into this? They know clear well that as downtown improves and becomes more of a destination, it helps every aspect of, of getting people to come here and prolonging that stay. So a mutual relationship, and it would be my guess, I'm speaking out of turn here, but it would be my guess that a city council would applaud these organizations coming together and crafting a proposal together, showing how they all can work together to make a funding source amplify its economic impact on the community. So that's that. Any questions on that? Make sense? Yeah, you know, as you figure out, I think one of the things that downtowns always do is um, when you sit there and let, I'm going to pick a number out of the air, it could be off, but let's say that that H tax is generating 100, I mean, uh, $1.6 million a year, um, then we now think, oh, we got $1.6 million to tap into. But realistically, if we are, if we're going to think about this with any kind of fairness whatsoever, um, the proportion or percentage of that H tax collection that comes from downtown is a proportion that is a, it's kind of a fair basis. So at the very least, it doesn't mean that anything is hard and fast, but from a bid board perspective, it at least means you can enter a conversation realistically. You know, because it's like if you're sitting there going, oh, well, I think we can figure out a really good way to spend $800,000. I don't think the bid is thinking realistically about that partnership and that, that revenue source. And that being said, I mean, the city itself probably, I'm, I'm going to guess on this too, but I would imagine when you have a city that has seen a funding source that performs, chances are they got some ideas of them, their own of how they'd like to spend some of that money. So being able to be very sensitive to that and, um, you know, Parks and Rec go into that a lot of times and different things like that. So um, I think that's something that we definitely want to foster a dialogue on. Second floor housing. 
Um, had a lot of folks. Tom, I know, was, was chumping some numbers for me. Uh, 180,000 potential square feet today. 180,000 upper floor housing square foot available today. Uh, Iowa, right next door, did a pretty thorough study on second and upper floor revitalization and restoration. They did five communities that they um, studied multiple downtown projects. They landed on an average cost of $110 per square foot on those revitalization projects for upper floor housing. If you were to take that and run the math, that is a $19.8 million investment across the board if you were to redevelopment everything. But standard figures show that a $110 investment is bringing $180 per square foot value. So you stand to gain $30 million valuation increase for downtown. Now, we get into science, we, we get kind of into number magic here, a little bit of voodoo, a little bit of, you know, just watch my hand as I do something over here. But projected, I think it's fair to say, I ran three different communities that were able to share property tax increases based off of downtown residential. I average out the numbers. That's the best I could do, really. I was not, did not have the ability to do any better. But I think this is a pretty compelling number. $325,000 of additional property tax revenue for every 100 units created. Why is that important? The number is important because we have got to educate the city council on their tax base growth off of any investment that you want them to make in helping to spur upper floor housing. So the thing that that, that number doesn't really have anything to do is it doesn't have anything, doesn't factor in uh, sales tax increase by having new residents that live downtown, doesn't have, it doesn't factor in the uh, sellability of getting professionals to choose to move to Grand Island because they have those options available. So again, that number can use a lot of massaging. Chances are you could sit there and if you had the data at your, you know, if you had all your rates, you can figure this out. I just didn't have that stuff. And believe it or not, I was here for branding. So I had to come to a point where I'm like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this out to start that discussion. If it's wrong, I think we can formulate the right one. Um, so second floor housing is, and upper floor housing is a really, really big opportunity for your community. Then the final thing before we get to branding, parking authority. Um, right now you have a parking authority or you have a parking assessment fee, I should say, that was formulated um, at a time where your community had a dramatically different economy. So I think that the where do you start? You start by making an estimate of what it is going to take to convert your current parking facilities into being up-to-date parking facilities and then how long it will take to maintain those for the next 10 years. You add those numbers together, that creates the bulk sum of what you are trying to earn. You then retool the way that you assess the fees. Um, 1999 master plan does speak to some usage, appropriate usage uh, for different business type per square footage. Those could be standards that we use to help create the parking formula. Um, parking fees should be created to apply to all organizations. Um, your bid currently exists, uh, exempts uh, owners that do not pay ad valorem taxes your parking fees need to apply across the board. Uh, I floated this by a couple of nonprofit organizations that exist in downtown today, and they said they would be wholeheartedly in favor of it if it impacted the way that they wanted it to. And the reason they are wholeheartedly for it is because of bullet point four. Religious institutions are currently the highest ratio of parking need to square footage in the district. Um, 
so they are stressing the parking infrastructure. They're also stressing the business environment and they are not contributing to that. That being said, um, you can read into this suggestion however you want, but the way that I want you to read into it is this is a completely appropriate way to change the economy on downtown churches, period. Um, many times these, these um, parking assessment fees build in exceptions and exemptions based on property owners that do own their own parking. So what ends up happening is you earn credit back if you own your own parking. And um, I am, I'm doing my best. I wanted to have some examples for you today. I've got three different communities again that are, are getting me copies of their standards so I can pass those on to you. Uh, but that's the best I could do for so far. All right, before I jump into design stuff, does that all make sense? That was like a whole lot of stuff to talk about in a very short little bit of time. But um, I, I feel like at the very least, the things that I hit on as the precursor to this, the presentation are the major issues that the organization needs to tackle. All right. So that being said, now we're going to jump over to this. Um, this is where it gets kind of scary, actually. Okay, so the first thing that I always like to do is I always like to take a look at um, what already exists. So obviously we've got the city logo, we've got chamber logo, we've got the new CBB logo, and the EDC logo. And we also have this downtown logo. Now, as of now, the downtown logo has served as the logo for the destination of the place as well as any activities of the bid. So that can be problematic. Now, when you look at all of these, does anybody see a thread that is stitching them all together? I, I don't know. I, I don't see I can't find one. Yeah, they all say Grand Island. Um, you know, typically, if, if we're kind of tackling this from a, a, a community-wide standpoint, one of the things that we might try to see if we could do is figure out some way that we could create some continuities through typeface and that kind of stuff. But, but honestly, I mean, the fact is, um, especially with these, these three quasis in the middle, they're all good. It's all good stuff. It's not, you don't have anybody that's got a horrible logo out there. Um, and to be honest with you, even with this, this was not a horrible logo. It wasn't really even a bad logo. But for anybody out there who thought that you were clever for putting a lamppost on your logo to be, to re be representative of a downtown, it's not clever. It's commonsensical. It makes sense but it's not it's not necessarily all that unique you have done a really good job of deploying this though you've got gateway signage into the district you've got metal banners throughout the district our goal i believe is to oh, downtown is not going away and we've got some places that we can continue to use that so that's not a big deal what we wanted to do though and this was a request that came from you it was also a request that was named all the way back in the 99 plan. You need a marketing identity. Um, I cannot tell you how many times this week I heard Haymarket on the bricks and Old Market mentioned. And then when I read that, that master plan and saw it repeated back then all those years ago, it was like, okay, obviously there's something going here. Um, I wanted to... to create something that made sense but I wanted it to be contemporary and honestly I wanted it to be a little bit edgy not creepy edgy but edgy your consumers do not trust that downtown can be cool they think they've heard the stories and have been let down time and time again so we want to create something that's solid is simple but it will build that confidence so I started out by identifying the typefaces I picked 
two different typefaces that are both sans serif typefaces. The top brings in some signature typefaces. Now, if you look at this and you're like, oh, well, heaven forbid, I mean, there's no script on there. We're a historic community. How can this be? Are we leaving history behind? No, believe it or not, you can be a cool historic place without using script. So I wanted something that would be very legible and would be able to, to kind of bounce between a couple different personalities. The top is called Archive. Um, it, it's got some kind of cool elements to it. The, the letters round off slightly on the edges. Some of the letters have some kind of cool signature elements like the disconnect in R that's also repeated in the B. Um, and then that secondary typeface is, it's actually, I think, a, a trade gothic uh, condensed and just a nice, clean, very legible um, sans serif. So the next thing that I did was define a color palette. Colors are hugely important in being able to connect the dots. Up until this point, you had had some stuff that you kind of used, but it really was, it was used over and over again on signage, but then once we got into print materials, it kind of deviated a little. So what I did was I took four of my favorite photos that I took while I was here. I loaded all four of those photos and I ran color palettes out of those photos. And I picked the five color palette that I felt like most represented what I was shooting for. And this isn't exactly it. Let me turn this just so you can kind of see. There's always a difference between the projector and reality. This is actually a palette that was pulled from a photo of the front of the Grand Theater. Strangely enough, when, you, when I looked at the colors, the colors were very, very similar to the colors on the sign at, what is it, Bartle? Bar 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 Barton Backs Gallery. Also, some of the colors are very similar to the colors that were in the pre-existing signage, but a little bit different variation there. We've got a dark, dark, rich blue. We've got a light blue, kind of almost a cyan. We have a, an interesting, it's almost like a copper patina type color. Uh, came out of the pale green, but then we see, I saw that color repeated as I color sampled the county courthouse. Then we've got this nice, rich kind of golden color, and then we've got this, this kind of red that starts to lean a little towards orange. So five color palette. It gives us enough color to have activity and kind of vibrance. So typeface, colors, and then the next thing that I wanted to look at was I wanted to look at the message. What do we want to say to folks? Because our focus is just on downtown, we do not have to carry the same burden that we might if we're trying to... to tell the entire community story. Um, one of the litmus tests that people use up against taglines is they, they ask themselves, well, can anywhere else say this? And I always tell them that's not fair. That's not really a fair test because if you really look at it, any shoe company could have said, just do it. And there was nothing specific that kept any of the others to, from saying it. But Nike said it first and then repeated it so many times that nobody else would dare say it. Um, your downtown message is kind of similar to that. We need a certain simplicity that hammers the point home, but we need to also acknowledge the fact that there is skepticism in the market. People don't believe that what you say is going to happen is actually going to happen. So, I'm going to take a stab at this. I will tell you, I wrote this right before y'all came in. I have not proofed it. There. I'm a horror. I've got dyslexia. Who knows what this actually says? But I'll read it the way that it sounds in my head. Over 150 years ago, settlers who had heard the tales of a grand island in the middle of the prairie set a goal to make that place their home and were determined to make it happen. And happen it did. A short time later, the railroad set their sights on connecting Grand Island with this growing country. They were dedicated to make it happen. And within a few years, Grand Island Station was born out of what many called an endless sea of prairie dog holes. Our downtown grew out of that station. It grew tall and it grew wide. It became the center of our town and the heart of our community.
As with many communities, the economy began to change. Customers began to leave and the once vibrant heart faded. The things that needed to happen simply ceased to, and people began to feel like downtown had faltered. But there's a new energy in Grand Island, and this, ugh, and this new momentum is picking up steam. Alongside those same rails where our community was built, we are crafting an inspirational renaissance. The Grand Theater once again glows under its neon lights, bringing families together downtown. Buildings once empty are now filled with vintage treasures, trendy fashion, and delicious sweets. High rises are rising again, offering luxury housing options in this historic place. And we're not done yet. In fact, we're just getting started. We invite you to come rediscover our historic downtown along the tracks. See the changes we are making and discover the exciting vision for this place we call home. And you'll understand what we mean when we say, Railside is happening. So when we bring it all together, we have this whole concept of rail side, simple, clean, it's not on the rails, because it sounds like on the bricks, simple phrase, and this simple icon that goes along with it. And, you know, when I developed the icon, I was playing off a couple things. First of all, I hate railroad imagery. I need you to know that. Every community that has ever had a train run through it wants to be a railroad town. So I am very reticent because railroad imagery is dictating. I wanted to try to find a way that I could connect to the railroad in a contemporary and cool way. So when you look at that rhythm and pattern of that icon, and you see it in relationship to rail side. To me, it is representative of kind of a section of that rail. But then when you dig in a little bit deeper, it is also representative of your street grid and your three main streets of first, second, and third. We have four main colors that allow us to connect with the different streets in that district. And then we have an area below it where we can introduce that tagline. Now, I want to go through and I want to start building this out because obviously not only am I showing you a new logo, I'm showing you a whole new name. So most of you probably hate it upon first uh, glance and that's absolutely natural. Um, what if you like it? If you like it, then, then you're all good. We're all good. Um, we always, I, I always like to check everything that I do. I want to make sure that it works in black and white, make sure that it's still strong and impactful in one color. Going through these days, it's essential that we search through and make sure that it works in social media adaptations. So creating, whether it's a, a profile pic, whether it's an app icon, then being able to build that expansion so that you can start to connect the colors and the logo variations into the individual streets that make it on. Down the road, you can use the same design foundation to go through and connect with additional growth areas that are perceived to be connected with downtown. So here we take that same grid structure, we create kind of a stylized four built into it, change the color palette up a little bit to a color palette that's going to be more contextually appropriate in the, the so I took a photo that I had taken on fourth and changed the color palette up a little. Now, with this, again, that very, very simple icon, you start to see how the simplicity can grow into immense meaning. So we talked about that development corporation. Take that icon, turn it on the side, rail side development corporation, the RDC, where growth is central. Being able to position that organization as the umbrella organization to tie those all together. Go back to the 1999 study. One of the things that was pointed out in that study was the bid was at a distinct operational disadvantage because it was a taxing body that was attempting to do positive volunteer-oriented business. So I think one of the things we need to think about is we need to think about coupling and separating out the difference between the bid as a funding agent and whatever organization it might be. Might be that that organization is RDC, might be that you go and you adopt the Main Street identity. 
you tie this grassroots revitalization effort in Grand Island to a nationwide network of 1,800 communities across the country that are employing the Main Street model. With that, you can take those four colors and that icon, and you can create identities for the four committees of the four-point approach. I'm not saying you have to do this, but I want to I float every idea so that as you are really thinking about communication and organization, you can make the best decision for your community. Where it starts to get really fun to me is once you've got the colors, the graphic base, the typeface, the brand extension into the events. So being able to take it, roll it over into events that happen downtown, creating different variations that work, um, making sure that the, the visual impact that happens in the community gets reinforced, kind of turning that thing up on its side, making the green team, um, green safety vest, green construction helmets, you know, you take that and really make it work for you because those people are the visual manifestation of the investment. So by making them even more visible, not looking like construction workers, but looking like people that are making the, the um, district better, that's where you really start to, to win some points. With the simple design, you've got the opportunity to create, create extremely professional looking collateral material. This is a development guide that can package together development incentives, facade grant programs, upper floor housing grants, all of those white papers and dynamics and information that you have to drive development in your, your downtown. You can take that same overall design approach. This is designed as an eight and a half by 11 uh, piece. You can create a shopping and dining guide. This is designed as a five and a half by eight and a half. One of the great things about doing a design like this is the moment that you change that single dominant photo you send a visual indication that something has changed. So when we redesign that map piece, you can create a way that you can indicate to people that a new one's out. One of the best things that you need to know about annual shopping and dining guides, I put annual on there for a reason. The moment you print that sucker, it's wrong. Because somebody has closed or moved or changed their number or whatever. Um, we need to start getting a very good idea on what our distribution looks like, what our capacity, what our, our quantity need is. And I think this is a place where we can lean on the CVB to help with some expertise. Because if there's anybody that knows about distribution of marketing materials, those guys. So being able to really hone in and create a piece that we can produce on an annual basis and know that it maximizes that, that up-to-date uh, content. From there, I want to talk a little bit about signage. I've designed a, a comprehensive wayfinding system that can exist within your district. Taking those same logos, um, a lot of times we over-design wayfinding signage. Those main signs that we see are called trailblazer signs. Those signs need to have no more than three destinations on them. We design these to, to match up with the MUTCD standards by the U.S. Department of Transportation. If, you've ever re uh, if you're ever bored and want to read something amazing, the um, MUTCD standards of 2009 is an absolutely stunning read. I downloaded it to my iPad, and my iPad weighed seven pounds more. Um, it, it really is. It's, a, it's an absolutely horrible document. But uh, it is the guidelines by which we have to adhere to. And since you've got this highway running through your downtown, federal government has said that signage that does not adhere to their standards is cause for them to pull federal funding. So we want to make sure we get that right. Um, I have two different scales there. Those two different scales are going to be oriented to different speed traffic. Uh, the one on the, the right is going to be more mixed between vehicular and pedestrian, while the one on the left will be more vehicular. You can see little things like being able to have customized sign blades that might exist inside the district. Um, I designed some very narrow banners. Some of your historic poles have integrated in light banners, but they're very short poles. So being able to create long verticals, that's cool. That's different. It's not the same proportion. There's, I kind of like that. Um, on the far left, you'll see a, a map. You'll also see an area map integrated into a pole mount. And probably the most important sign in the whole system is parking sign. Believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, you all have got really, really well 
planned parking resources. And they just need to be signed to a little bit better. We need to let people know that at virtually every perpendicular, you have the opportunity to turn and find parking. Um, one other thing that I did not put on here, but I think is going to be very important for us to focus on, especially along third, is at our intersections, we are going to design some pedestrian oriented, what we call more to explore signs. These are the signs that send pedestrian traffic down your perpendiculars to help make them aware of what businesses might exist on blocks adjoining that. So I'll be able to design those and kind of show them to you. Talking about banners though, I wanted to go ahead and just kind of show you how if you did go through and do a more robust banner system, um, you can use solid color banners to help craft more individualized personalities and kind of senses of place around those three streets. I know that's something Dee had asked about was this idea of being able to use color to create districting mindset throughout your district. Um, we over-design banners a lot of the time because we design them against white backgrounds instead of photos of where they're going to go. I like to use a lot of solid color. I like to use banners to create a false ceiling. I like to create banners to, to have rhythm and, and to be able to lower somebody's visual cone. If you design banners right, it actually slows traffic down. So being able to have something that exists in that public space. And then um, I wanted to just kind of show you a series of ads. All these photos I took in the last day, um, showing you how you can kind of pull these, these images together. Taking the image, taking an impactful, confident headline, downtown blockbuster is happening. Timeless is happening. Higher level thinking is happening. Style is happening. So you can see this stuff just, it starts to, it's a very, very easy platform to allow your business communities to show off what they have to offer, to allow your assets to shine, to really stitch together some of the things that make your district unique, being able to show off the spaces that you want to celebrate as standards for the new tomorrow. So with that, holy moly, I was able to do that in an hour. It is, uh, it is five o'clock. Um, it is now, it's your turn. I'd like to hear your thoughts, general impression. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. it, it makes you start thinking of the old track. Right. So the real track ties all into that. And one item where you had a color identifying first level. Mm -hmm. What about adding fourth? I, absolutely. I think, you know, the main, I was doing my best as I was kind of tiptoeing through this to, I, I think that it makes the expandability in the fourth street is pretty commonsensical based off the standard that I set, there's one color left. So you can go with the four colors and you can, you, you know, you can pull that into that. But I do think that one of the things that we might want to entertain, depending on how we do it, that four street can actually have multiple identities. It can have an identity variation in that system showing that we're actually adopting it into our destination of downtown. And it can also have, this international identity. So that's a great point. Well, and that's the whole thing. That's what my business has been for 22 years. Right. Um, we have and we claim the, one of the best and most thriving ethnic business neighborhoods mm -hmm. in the state. I would agree. Um, I probably a broader range than that, from honestly. From restaurants to bakery yeah. shops to businesses and clothing stores and, and everything. It's, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, wow. <laughs> Good job. I'm Thanks. impressed. I Good. love it. Good. Uh, I have a dumb question. It's yeah. the only question I have because you went through so much detail. I see everything you were doing and it's perfect for growth. It's Good. extremely adaptable. Uh, you stuck with the rail side. I didn't know how that was going to work, but mm. you made it work. My dumb question is, uh, I guess I've never seen a downtown logo slogan or logo that didn't say downtown. Mm -hmm. um, how would you market this? Okay. 
that that dumb question is actually not dumb at all. It, you know, it, here is um, I think that the thing that we the the first you have got a couple different phases there, and and it is the the reason that you have the question is because it's not a simple thing to transition to. Um, rail side, let me see if I can say it the right way. All of rail side is downtown, but not all of downtown is rail side. Rail side does not have to be a physically defined place. Rail side is a redevelopment identity for downtown that gets adopted as growth dictates it to get adopted. I think that you can deploy everything that I have shown while simultaneously maintaining the identity that you've set for downtown Grand Island without feeling like you need to change it. Just like you have uh, downtown Omaha and Old Market is a part of that. Now the goal is, I will say, and this one, this is a little questionable at times, but I would say the goal is to have more of the district want to be included. And they want to be included by integrating the resources that we're making available to the community as a whole into the way that they're telling their stories. Um, we can, as I'm going through, I think that, I think that what I'm actually going to do is create a series of logos, that rail side logos, that are essentially evolutionary. I think that we're probably going to create one that says downtown Grand Island under it, but then also one that says Grand Island. So that over time, you can choose when you're comfortable jettisoning the extra information. So that's actually, that's a really, really good question. It's a question that is is going to require us to keep our ears to the ground and really kind of cultivate because, you know, you all are the one that wanted a marketing identity and now figuring out how to get it adopted and deployed might be a little bit tricky. But but no, I it, it is unbelievably easy for us to give you, I'd rather give you all the different variations you'd ever need, you know? And so, like, we might have one that just says Railside in downtown. Then we might have one that says Railside Grand Island, right? Railside, you know, we might have one that says Railside Historic Grand Island, you know? All those variations. It's, it's easier for me to give you the variations, and then you feel out that implementation. I think however you do it, though, you, you, I, think, I think we need to be careful to not make it confusing for people. I think if we jump into it, we need to jump into it and not, mm -hmm. you know, Confuse people with well, there's some downtown signs here, and we talked about downtown Grand Island here and rail side here. And you know well, I, mean? I will say this though: do not worry about the signs. That people people do not pick up on the variation that exists unless we point it out. So the thing that we want to do, I, I agree with you know, if you if you decide that this is where you're going to go, you want to start rolling things out in a good solid formation and like for example one of the things that I would recommend that we do we know without a shadow of a doubt that third is our primary experience opportunity for a visitor we want to remove all of the metal historic I mean metal downtown Grand Island banners from there we want to move all of those I would say we want to move all of those off of our first, second, and thirds, and start to concentrate them on entry corridors into the downtown district. There's nothing wrong with them. They're still very attractive. But use them as the borders. Exactly. You know, exactly. 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 And then that sets you up to be able to introduce the new imagery in the core. I love how you, because uh, for so long, the railroad is, when people first move to town, all you can hear is the train. Mm -hmm. And and then everybody Right. That's always been a, it's always been a, you know, little thorn here. But mm -hmm. how we turn that into a positive, I think, is great. 
And we're a railroad town. We, we kind of talked about the whole, we, we are a railroad it. town. We have to accept that's it. That's what we are. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm, things are going through my head like, you know, new businesses made in town. I mean, Maybe help advertise for them and say, "Look who's going rail side." Exactly. You know, and, absolutely. And I love that. Pitch it for pitch I love for that. The boutiques coming downtown. You know, and just well, and I'll there. tell you, last night I just did work over in Oklahoma. Got a friend of mine who, um, she was working at the university, and then transitioned over to the economic development director. She sent me a text last night, and they they have, I don't know how they did this really. They are renting this like. European style panel van for three months. They're going to wrap it in vinyl and they're putting a portable studio in the back of it and they're stopping people all throughout the community doing interviews with what they love about the town and tying it into the tagline and telling that story and and you know being able to to take the people on the front end of the momentum and turn them into amplifiers of the message. I love that idea. I think that's great. I love great. the other part is, is that you could start to now, if you have multiple locations, you use that as your location. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the YMCA, for example, has a satellite. And I know there's this conversation about building bigger mm -hmm. away from downtown. Right. Well, we may get to the point where this is where the investment becomes because they want to do rail side. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's rail side. It's a rail side. Yeah. And I think you can transition it when the logo and tagline rail side is happening downtown. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. As an initial. And you can drop the downtown name. Yeah, Absolutely. No, you're right. exactly right. And the other thing that I kind of like, the right, the, the other thing that I kind of like about it, too, is with that simplicity of the tagline, the tagline can go before or after the name. Mm -hmm. It's happening rail side or rail side, it's happening. And they both work. And so, no, I, I mean, I, I tell you, when you get done with a presentation and this kind of dialogue happens, this is rewarding because you can tell that you're starting to feel out the different angles from it. We talk about so many different things. The last two days, we talked about so many different things. And to me, we always seem to get offsided from the band creating the, the deal. And yet, you're, you're, how you come up with it is beyond me in three days. But <laughs> really, because it's a, we got off track. It, to me, it seemed like we were off track so many different times, mm -hmm. so many different subjects, and you were just taking it all in. Well, right. That's why you chose real estate. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I will say, I have never, I have never heard that, that phrase before. Like, I've never heard that terminology of rail side. Um, so there was something about that, that the simplicity of it, um, you know, it would allow, you could easily go down and, and get railsidegi.com. You know, and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, I, I looked for just Railside. Uh, apparently, there is a golf course in Illinois that was called Railside. So, so Railside.com, but I mean, we can burn the golf course down and then get the web domain. So, yeah. Anything else? Right, absolutely. Well, and, and that's, I, I don't know if you he said you got a lot of play with it. And, and, and the thing that is very, very important, and it it was, it was one of those things that I'm a big like I focus on this. When you deal with rail, not only can the image be very dictating, um, you can go from being connected to being hokey, without ever knowing it. So by having such a very, very strong foundation. It allows you this platform to use some of those phrases as headlines and that kind of stuff, but never necessarily going so far down the road that you've crossed the line. And, and so it allows you to have those kind of punches. And, and in, a, in that dose, it still maintains that cool kind of edginess. So. When we first started the process for the sculpture, mm. my particular bias was I wanted it to not be two things, trains or cranes. Right. I'd bet money you wouldn't have been able to get trains into this and make it work, but man, did you have 
<laughs> well, and, and and I mean, just so you know, not only do I sh did I share the same sentiment that you had, I had several people threaten me <laughs> that if a train or a and and I think that's the thing that I really like about it is that it's almost one of those things where I feel like I was able to connect with the train without actually having train imagery. Even the, the idea of track, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't. Right. You sort of see it in there, but it doesn't have to be that. Exactly. Right. It's the side. It's not. It's not the whole thing. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Nice. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. It is five o'clock. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's 10 after. Um, I, it, any other questions for the group as a whole? Obviously, I'm in no rush to get out of here. I don't fly out to the morning. So anybody that wants to stick around and ask me anything. But, uh, Is the majority of the rule that everybody loves them? Yeah. 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 Ye